Hi everyone, hope you're doing well, it's Ren here. Uh, in this video, I'm going to be continuing this little talk about uh, being an INFJ male uh, by delving into some more practical aspects of it or advice I could give as an older INFJ who's 31 years old and who believes that he has become a bit more uh, comfortable with himself and a bit more confident. Um, and so I will talk about past experiences of mine and sort of trajectories of learning that uh, might benefit uh, younger INFJs, for instance. Um, so this video was sparked by comments by um, someone called Todd on my last video uh, called uh, What It's Like to Be an INFJ. Uh, Todd's comment is actually quite short, so to give you the full context, I'll just read it. So it goes like this. Uh, Ren, I don't think I could express how encouraging and affirming this video is. As an INFJ man, it's been a struggle not internalizing society's sense of disdain for men who do not fit the standard male stereotype. Seeing you stand unapologetically in your true nature and thriving there is definitely pushing me to remain in the path I'm on. That said, are there some practical bits of advice or critical instructive experiences that you'd like to share for younger men that might expedite that journey. So thanks Todd. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I do think it's a great idea that you suggested and um, uh, and so there you go, a day later uh, I'm making this video. Um, <clears throat> perhaps a part of me was uh, was considering doing that already but maybe I was kind of like putting the feelers out uh, you know to check whether there might be people interested in that. Um, but uh, of course, of course, I can, I can, I can talk about uh, my experiences. Uh, I think, you know, when I started the channel back in July, it would have been a little strange or it would have been more difficult. But now that I'm a bit more comfortable making videos, uh, I think that uh, it, it's no problem talking about it. And you know, the mere fact of being able to talk about these things and talk about maybe either weaknesses or what people might perceive it weak as weaknesses or past mistakes. Um, it's, it's the mere fact of being able to talk about them uh, without being self-conscious or anything shows in a sense that some progress has been made towards self-acceptance. Um, because usually what you try to hide, in my opinion, or when people try to modify the truth, when people you know, uh, play with facts a little bit or distort the truth, or lies because they're uncomfortable with the truth. So they narrate either to themselves or to other people some kind of fiction. Of course, sometimes, and a lot of the time, the fiction is is, is sustained for coping reasons. And I don't think that it's immoral behavior to do that. Um, but uh, of course, I mean, if sharing my experience can be helpful, I will. So um, what, can, what kind of practical advice can I give? Because you're asking essentially two things here. You're asking in the first place, can I give some practical bits of advice? And on the other hand, you're wondering if I can share some instructive experiences. So what I'm thinking is maybe I could share some instructive experiences or at least experiences that I think are potentially instructive and then link it to the practical bit of advice or sort of mesh them together. Uh, so let's see. So. <laughs> Uh, male INFJ, well, technically I have been a male INFJ ever since the dawn of, not of time, uh, because uh, I I've only existed for 31 years, um, but for a while. And uh, I have certainly made mistakes and I have certainly uh, had to learn by trying and by making those mistakes, you know, um, but the fortunate thing is that uh, there, there definitely has been some learning. Uh, and since there's been some learning that I have achieved, I think um, I'm able now to kind of look back and uh, and draw some more formal lessons from from that learning, from from that from that trajectory that I followed. I have definitely made mistakes. Um, however, I would say, and I know it sounds kind of trite, but I will not be where I am without having made those mistakes. So, when you speak when you speak of expediting the, the whole business. Uh, for younger INFJ men, I am not sure that expediting is a good idea necessarily. Now, I don't mean that I want INFJ men, younger INFJ men or older INFJ men to, to 
to feel pain because that's like the only way that she can learn. Uh, but I do think that, you know, um, going through life and its uh, vagaries is part of, of the process, you know, um, because, you know, you need to, to face these things in order to grow out of them. Uh, so what I can provide as perspective is never going to, I mean, again, this, this probably sounds uh, kind of basic, but I do want to insist on the fact that what I can, can provide as a perspective is meant as maybe giving certain tips or clues in order to negotiate these passages, these these periods that will have difficult moments, rather than solve them. You know, the the proper key to to enhancing uh, others and to to helping them emancipate themselves is to build the the capacity in them rather than do the the, the thing for them. I know that's not what you're asking for, but I just want to emphasize that. Um, so now that I've said this um, in the typical manner of my lengthy introductions, um, maybe we can start looking into my past and those terrible, horrible mistakes I made. Well, I mean, no, I don't think I've made more or you know less mistakes that uh, you know than average. But there are definitely certain things that I've learned. Um, so let's start with this basic observation. You speak. I, I actually turned off my screen now. Uh, because I'm HSP and even having the screen on while doing something else can be a little painful. Uh, <laughs> but um, you speak about these um, norms that society has and that are kind of, they're kind of, you know, disregarding INFJ men because they really, they really do not conform or we do not conform as INFJ men to those norms of masculinity, for instance. Because, you know, if, if we're speaking about being INFJ men, uh, that's going to be the first topic, right? The, 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 the whole male dimension and what we're expected to like, what we're expected to be. Now, notice something. These norms, they are arbitrary. So they're, they're not inbuilt in, in, human, in humans. I mean, actually, sometimes, um, actually, maybe often, uh, you'll come across people who believe that these norms are inbuilt. Those people usually argue that it's like the other animals, you know, you look at walls or you look at other animals of that kind. There is an, there is an alpha male and he does kind of get all the females. <laughs> and then you have the other males and they're not as lucky. Um, but I think there's plenty of evidence that humans do not really function like animals and that there, is, there are such things as culture, as uh, creativity, intelligence, charm, that, uh, you know, do not really apply to animals, right? So, I mean, I absolutely love, I love animals. I have a cat and I love her very, very much. When I say that she has intelligence or that she's charming, I, in a way, I anthropomorphize her, but I'm conscious of the fact that I'm doing that. It's not real, like she doesn't have these qualities. You cannot say of a dog that he's cultured or that he has charisma in a way, you know what I mean? So, there are things that really are specific to humans and that go beyond uh, what we would observe about other species. And um, I think that when we come to talk about or to think about manliness, um, there is, there are all these dimensions included. So, I mean, I'm not denying the fact that like for some women, a man could look very masculine uh, in a certain way, or he can have a rugged face, or you know, he can have a certain kind of behavior, he can have a certain kind of physique, you know, that's true, and that's completely okay, you know? I mean, I guess the idea here is we're not supposed to want to appeal to absolutely everyone, you know? Like, I have female friends who like uh, guys, you know, I like, I, I, I have female friends who like guys who would fit the kind of archetype of manly as society, um, conveys it. Um, I have female friends who like men who they consider manly for completely other reasons, you know, people who have the courage, in French we have an expression, to have the courage of one's opinions. I will have le courage de ses opinions. If you have the courage, the unapologetic, respectful but unapologetic courage of one's opinion and one's position, I mean, some women uh, do find that very attractive and that doesn't have as much to do with um, with looking like you do weights hours, hours and hours every day. In fact, it's very possible to do uh, 
waits hours every day. Uh, I've met some guys who do that who actually don't have the courage of their opinions, do not have a lot of personality. I'm sorry, but you know it's true. I've, I've met those men. And women do not find them particularly attractive and they do not find them particularly manly for that matter. So it, it can clearly be seen that manliness is something that, uh, and, and masculinity is something that goes way beyond the mere sort of like plastic, as we say in French, like the physical aspect of things, the external aspect of things. It's, it's something that's transcendental in a way. Um, so there's that, there's this network of norms that are arbitrary and that take into account a certain view of masculinity and manliness that is partial and that we should have a form of def defiance towards, I think, or respectful defiance towards. Um, and then there is another interesting aspect to your comment, which is that, and I am just the same as you are, despite the fact that we know that these things are arbitrarily imposed, we cannot help but care. It, it upsets us because we cannot help but care in some way. Like we do feel like it's happened to me in my life to, and plenty of times, to feel kind of, I don't know, diminished or emasculated by certain of these norms, how, how they're depicted in the media and stuff like that. I'm sure it's happened, you know, it's, it's never pleasant, but at the end of the day, they're just, they're creations, they're not real, they're not actual, they're creations, they're a certain type of thing that is uh, displaying itself as being the, the, the universal norm, which it is not, but it is true that at the same time, it influences us. We cannot pretend that it doesn't influence us. Uh, otherwise, we would not have this, these questionings. Um, and so I think that here, in the kernel of these different observations, there are lots of the potential clues to dealing with the situation when you're an INFJ man. Uh, so, for, for example, I learned the hard way that... Um, I mean, really, the, 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 the most important thing is to embrace who one is. So I went through a phase, you know, to talk about my experience more specifically, I went through a phase in my 20s, because, you know, in my, when I was younger, like when I was 18 to 20-ish or something like that, I was really shy and I wasn't super experienced with women in, in, in any case. So I, I guess at the time I was really, I went through that phase at that age of really wishing that I, that I could be more like the other men, right? That, and when I say the other men, even that was a kind of idealized version in my mind, but the men who were more stereotypically manly and appealed to women and all that. And, um, and so, I mean, I, 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 was, I, was, I was more of a sports person then, I did a lot of tennis. Uh, and I, when I, I went to Ireland, I went to Ireland and I, I think that to my personality, I added something because it was a new place, I had never lived there, and I felt like I could sort of add a little trait to my identity without anyone noticing that it was artificial because uh, no one would know me there. And I think in some ways it was a good thing because I left a society which at the time I found, I found too crushing, which was Marseille society, because Marseille society is quite macho and was absolutely not for me. And I think sometimes it's it can be a good thing. It was indicative of something smart that I did, which was to, when you feel like in your environment, people are not making you feel comfortable, you don't feel like you belong, always keep in mind that um, there are other environments, there are other communities, there are other places where you can have people who are more like you and that where you are immediately located is not necessarily illustrative of the whole world. You know, And that's something that I, I didn't even expect to be so true until I went to Ireland and you know, where in Ireland actually the, the society Although men do have a tendency to hide their feelings a little bit, it, it's nowhere near as much as the South of France was. But still, I, I did something then that went a bit too far, which I think if I had learned at the time, if I had seen myself now at the time, or a vision of myself, I would have not done, which is I, I kind of artificially um, try to appear tougher than I was personality-wise. and. I think you could associate that with, you know, to, to take the, you know, to stick to the INFJ example with the use of TI, because INFJ men and someone was observing in the comments, and I think that's true. Uh, more than often than INFJ women, INFJ men tend to be TI reliant, sometimes at the expense of FE, because TI t does have this dimension of supposedly masculine 
like rationality, a little bit detached from emotion, where, whereas FE is the opposite. And so if you emphasize your TI, you know, and I did that, I thought that I would appear more decisive, more cutting, not necessarily in a violent sense, but in conversations, asserting myself, being very in your face, being fearless. But that involved a certain dimension of arbitrariness, you see, because I felt like I was, I had to create a little alternate version of myself in which like I was a, a, a more of a TI user than I really was and more, more in your face and fearless than I really was. And the thing is, actually that did help get some attention. I will not lie about this. I will not lie. But the problem is, first of all, it's stressful because you use TI more than you should in, in functional terms. You're not supposed to be using it so much. So it was stressful to continue having this kind of persona. It was a persona, so I could not really be myself. But of course, imagine that you start dating someone who has liked you because of the traits that you were displaying, which were, in a way, an extension of a persona. Like, sooner or later, you're going to want to be yourself with the person. You're not going to be able to remain in your persona all the time. Well, and then the, the thing is, when the person starts to notice that you have those traits that actually are kind of effy driven, you're more sensitive than you wanted to let appear, actually, and it happened to me when I was younger, they leave you, they leave you, and it can be super up upsetting. And I repeated that mistake so much. You know, and what I want to say is, it might appear like it's tempting to overuse, not to overuse TI, but to display a lot of T-ness when you're an INFJ, because contrary to say like uh, types like INFPs and other types that have T in their lowest rank, it's possible for an INFJ man to emphasize their T when it's developed, because because we have tertiary TI, so we can sure like ramp it up and make it replace FE at least for temporary moments. If that's what you do. It's a losing game ultimately in regards to the other sex, you know, because you're trying to fit those norms that you cannot ignore and you're trying to appear tougher than you are. Now, it could pay off in the short term because you're going to attract some attention from people who are actually not worth it because they like you for the things that you're not. So I would say rather than do that, embrace yourself as the sensitive, logical feeler. You're logical, but you're also sensitive. You're insightful that you are. I mean, the thing is, if you, as long as you rely on the persona, the success that you encounter will be very precarious, will lead to nothing long lasting, and will, and will end up with you being heartbroken because the person eventually leaves you. And that happens all the time. Um, and I think that with INFJs, at least with me, it happened with this over-reliance over -reliance on my teeness. Now, um, if you do not do that, you know, you, you let your, your T sort of be where it belongs and you sort of embrace yourself as someone who's a logical feeler rather than a sensitive thinker. You know, you're more of a feeler than a thinker, even though you, you're logical. Um, and if you embrace that, then really embrace it. That's your person and their self-acceptance. And that's something that I began to do. And I began to do it a bit too late. But I, when, I became, when I started being like, I, I was just so annoyed. You know, I was like, I don't want to rely on this kind of persona anymore. Persona anymore. And it had become in Ireland in a, in a place where I could essentially create it out of nothing. And for a lot of pe people to think it was my person, I knew, I knew it was not quite my person. And so I set to just embrace myself more. So I stayed way more in touch with my feeling side. And that's when I discovered something that I could not have expected. And it is that... What's attractive is not to, you know, is not to be like uh, in your face or cutting or, or very thinky. Um, and it's not even that of being particularly feely. It's to be, and like I, like I said in the previous video, to be completely unapologetic because there is no apology to give, zero apology to give about who you are, about who you are, right? Um, that's how you are. And if someone at some point challenges it, the best approach is to remain completely unruffled by it. To say, whatever, man, like, you know, this is, uh, this is who I am. And that's, you're not going to change that. You're not going to make me want to do this or that, uh, even though I see no reason to. And this self-acceptance is way more attractive and attractive in the long run, in a, in a, in a non-precarious sense, in a sustainable sense, than having the semblance of being someone you're not and that you, and keeping that semblance alive for a time that is bound to be finite, you know? And so 
that's it, you know, that's it. Like, um, I realized that it was uh, better for me to, to be in touch with my FE. I attracted more interesting people. I realized something that could not be underestimated. And I, and I mean absolutely no joke about this. And I gave way too much importance to too many people in my life that were uninteresting to me, that were not worth my time. So never, never forget this as an INFJ man and probably as people of other types. Most people, most people are not worth your time. So if you know that most people are not worth your time, try to not put too much importance in, into what these people think or may think or believe or may believe because at the end of the day, you don't really want to be with them. You don't really want to spend that much time with them. Like often when we envy them, it's because we envy the projection that we think that they represent vis-a-vis -vis the network of norms that makes us feel inadequate. But actually, those are usually chimeras. They're not real, you know. Uh, so ask yourself, would you want, really want to be these other people? Like at the end of the day, do you really want to be the, these other people or do you want to be you? And if the answer is that you kind of w would want to be you, well, it's you should embrace you, you know, because that is the key. I mean, I am absolutely believe, I absolutely am convinced at this stage that the key to, to being like a manly or self-affirming person is to have a deep appreciation for who you are. And, and again, for the fact that you're kind of blessed in a way, imagine like 2% of the population uh, or for INFJ men, like 0.5% of the population are built the way you're built. You could see it as a curse or you could see it as a blessing. You know, just imagine like this wealth of insight uh, and the influence that you could have with your use of Effie. And, you know, in relation to that, I, I direct you to my videos on the INFG and seduction, the INFG and charisma, the INFG and dating. I've made some videos on these topics. Maybe I'll link them down in the description box. But, you know, you have a lot, a plenty of strength and you have no real reason to, um, to feel that you're inadequate. I know this is not easily done. It's easier said than done. Uh, but that's what I've learned, you know. Uh, the temptation to develop a persona uh, is not a better thing than uh, to be self-pitying about who you are. Self-pity is not a good avenue uh, and te temptation to develop a persona is not really a good avenue either. Uh, I personally had to go through it to eventually grow into myself. I started from a, a kind of distant, kind of shaded sense of self-pity when I was younger to creation of a persona, more thinky persona to self-acceptance. I had to go through these phases. I don't know if everybody has to go through these phases, but what I do know is that the, 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 the sustainable, stable, and, you know, somewhat, well, I would say more attractive to myself and to others ending point is, is the self-acceptance. But it's the self, it's the self-acceptance where you essentially say, I love being a feeler. And, you know, I love being a feeler. You know? So, you have to reach that point and good luck with it. Uh, so maybe I'll give some more, uh, I'll make some more videos in the future about my experiences because I could give more, you know, uh, more concrete examples yet. And I could talk about how my, I derive a lot of my self-worth also from having like an activity that I love and I know that like people kind of, it's not like they admire me for it, but they respect it. So I do a lot of work on philosophy and I, and I do a lot of work on it and I embody it in my life and something that I do and that people know me for and I respect it and it's something that I associate with myself and it, I derive confidence from it to do something that you're proud of. It doesn't have to depend on sports, but to do something that you're proud of and to wear it proudly. All right, see you guys. Let me know what you think.